We've been doing a series here on Lockdown Horn Frogs. We're going to reset the roster after spring practice. Who transferred in? Who transferred out? Who's returning? Who did we lose? We'll talk about quarterback and running back today. It's Lockdown Horn Frogs. It's your team every day. You are Locked On Horn Frogs, your daily podcast on the TCU Horn Frogs. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. That's right, Locked On Horn Frogs, your team every day. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. You can also find us wherever it is you get your podcasts. We're free and available wherever podcasts are found. I've been doing this series uh, since last week where I kind of look at, okay, what does the roster look like at each different position group after spring practice? The portal is slowed down. Maybe TCU adds one more player in the portal, but honestly, I think they're probably done. They're still active in trying to find talent for that 2025 class, obviously. But what are the names you need to know or who are the names you need to know going into the season that will be the most impactful players for TCU football? And for at wide receiver, at DB, at offensive line, there's a lot of shuffling around. Now, the position groups we're talking about today, I'm just going to combine quarterback and running back into one segment here. There wasn't a ton of movement. But there are a few new faces, and really we'll just talk about the state of those positions, where they are, what has to happen this upcoming season for TCU to be successful. And we'll start with the spot that everybody always wonders about. It's the the position in football that gets all the glory and all the, um, I guess, hate is probably the wrong word. Blame is a a better descriptor. It it all falls on the QB in a lot of ways, right? And so for the past two seasons – Chandler Morris, at least going into the year, has been your starting quarterback, and that is no longer the case. He is moving on. He transferred this offseason and landed in North Texas. I think that'll be a good fit for him. I would love to get Sonny Dykes in a one-on-one situation where maybe he felt comfortable talking off the record about the past two offseasons, ultimately his decision to go with Chandler Morris and what he saw in, in Chandler specifically, because I was a defender for, I guess, really the first half of the season last year. Even in wins, the offense looked clunky at times. I, I think about games against Houston and SMU where they won, but it still felt like there were a lot of points being left on the board. And honestly, that was the story of the offense the entire season. Josh had some really good games against Baylor and BYU. But the red zone efficiency was a question. You know, the short yardage situations, being able to get a push with your O-line when you needed it. But in the first half of the year, the offense really struggled. And we thought it was going to hum along and be good with Chandler Morris playing quarterback. He had won the the job the previous season. He got hurt. Max Duggan took over. And I, I guess based on what we heard and kind of what we knew, the, the choice of Chandler over Max made a little bit of sense. It made sense in my mind from the perspective of now ultimately it worked out how it should have and the staff kind of got, I don't want to say bailed out because I don't want to act like an injury was a good thing, but bottom line was the guy who needed to start ended up being the dude who was there in all 15 games for him. But, you know, word was Max wasn't always a great practice player. He had – incredible intangibles. He had mobility. Um, And when the lights came on, he was tough. He made plays. But week to week in practice, it didn't always look great. And supposedly Chandler was better in those moments. And so leading up to the season, they felt like the offense could be uh, better with him at at the helm. And looking back on it, going into last year, I should have I should have had more questions in my mind just given the fact that he looked really lost in that Colorado game before he went down with an injury. And, I mean, they they got the offense going a little bit in the third quarter before Max took over, but it was really the running game with Amari DiMercato and and Kendra Miller starting to churn out yardage that changed that football game. But I don't want to spend the whole segment belaboring it. The last thing I'll say about it, I'm always careful and I don't like – I don't like talking about or assuming things that happen behind the scenes because I just feel like we we get a we get a, a small window into what's actually happening. But I do feel like it was really clear. I don't know all the reasons why. That when Josh Hoover took over last year, I mean, maybe the team didn't 
take leaps and bounds as far as being better. They win a couple games against teams that they were favored against. But the team just seemed to respond a lot better to him. And so I don't know if that was just his personality, his leadership. I'm not sure if it was as simple as the season just looked like it was headed in a really bad direction and getting a new face out there was just a welcome change. But even in, you know, losses and in tough moments for Josh in the back half of the season, it, it just felt like the, the team responded to his energy and his leadership better. And so I'm, I'm excited to see what he can do this upcoming year in 2024. But Chandler transferred out, ended up in UNC. They also last, lost Grant Tisdale. Um, and Grant was originally from Allen. He went to high school at Allen. He played at Old Miss, Southeast Louisiana. Got some playing time in that um, Houston game. Uh, or not Houston game, the BYU game last season, uh, which was cool. But Grant was a walk-on QB that he kind of bounced around and is now looking for another destination to fill out his college eligibility. They brought in Ken Seals from Vanderbilt. And Ken's got experience in the SEC, 22 starts. Um, his best year was probably in 2020. He had a 64% completion percentage. And the other two seasons, it was 56 and 58. He was sacked 45 times at Bandy. That's rough, man. And, I mean, I, I think a lot of that's just – Bad teams usually have bad offensive lines, and he was behind a bad offensive line at Vanderbilt that was facing great defensive linemen each and every week, and so it's tough to make things happen. I do think it is – it's intriguing to me. Overall, I think the Ken Seals edition is a really good one uh, for what they're going to ask him to do, which is be a veteran presence in that quarterback room. If he has to come in the game, they can, you know – run a lot of the offense. He should understand it well. He got a ton of reps in spring practice with Josh Hoover missing spring practice. But he's not really a mobile guy. Or maybe he is and it just hasn't been shown. But, I mean, this is more of a true pocket passer. Like, he only had one season in his career where he had positive rushing yards. A lot of that was because of sacks. But it also speaks to the fact that he just wasn't getting a lot of attempts with carries. And so we've talked this offseason about it. it Kendall Bryles' offenses typically – function better when you have a mobile QB. We're hopeful that maybe Josh Hoover can bring more of that dimension to the offense this upcoming season. We didn't really see that when he came in relief of Chandler Morris last year. And then they also have Haas Haney, the true freshman, who could be a factor as well. But, yeah, I mean, Ken Seals, the, the, the big concerns for me are big concerns. The concerns I have, 22 interceptions. So got to take care of the ball better. But, again, being under pressure, being on a – an SEC team that was um, struggling that contributed to that, obviously. And then his best games in his career were against UConn and Colorado state. He really struggled against SEC competition. Now we can add the caveat that Vanderbilt really struggled against SEC competition as a team. Right. But uh, yeah, I mean, those were his, those were his best games as a starter were against UConn and Colorado state over three seasons. He did throw 28 touchdown passes. Um, had 22 interceptions, got sacked 45 times. I mean, I think he will be surrounded with better talent or at least talent that is more comparable to the rest of the conference if he has to come in and play, and that should lead to better numbers if he's called upon. Um, Haas Haney, the true freshman, I, I mean, really my question is, do they find a way to get him involved and use his athleticism somewhere on the field, whether that's having a special package at quarterback? I think that would make the most sense, or if there's some other ways that he um, – could be a factor, but that's a, that's a name to know. And then Josh Hoover's coming back. And Josh, after you know being a starter in the back half of the season last year, didn't go through spring practice because of an injury. I mean, the main things for me, for Josh, he's got to take care of the ball better. He had nine interceptions, um, had a couple multi-interception games, had some poorly timed picks like that one at the end of the first half against Texas. And then he's got to be better against better competition this year. His two wins last season were against BYU and Baylor. Those were cool moments. They were also against teams that TCU was favored to beat at home. Um, and so a lot of this year is predicated on him taking the next step, processing things better, being better in this offense, getting on the same page with his new wide receivers. And, of course, it's a team effort. O-line's going to have to be better. Those – Wide receivers are going to have to be more involved in getting reps in practice. 
Uh, we'll talk about running back in a minute, but a lot of a lot of responsibility falling on Josh Hoover this year to take this thing and run with it. Um, and I think he's up to the challenge for sure. But you got to actually execute and get out there and, and do the job. Um, and so that'll be not only the challenge for him, but for the rest of the the offensive team and the offensive staff at running back. Also, not a ton of movement. Uh, Corey Ring transferred out, and I mean, he ended up at UTEP. I think it's as simple as just wasn't getting a lot of opportunities. Uh, that was an exciting name when he got here a few off seasons ago. I mean, he had done some things on special teams at Florida State and looked like he could be an explosive player, but just never really came to fruition. So he he's moving on. Um, he also lost to Monty Bailey, who had over a thousand yards last year and ended up being an undrafted free agent for the Kansas City Chiefs. Explosive player. I mean, he was a workhorse last year. Like he stepped up and was really good for this football team. Um, one thing I do wonder about Amani Bailey, Jared Wiley, like some Brandon Coleman, some of your guys, that was a rough year last year, but those were guys that showed toughness and leadership, even in the midst of it all. You did lose that. So somebody's gonna have to step up and take that role this upcoming season. One candidate for that is Cam Cook who Sonny recently, Sonny Dykes recently said on 365 Sports that he thinks Cam is going to be the next great productive TC running back. And they were kind of worried about this running back position before spring camp, but after going through all the practices, they feel really good about it. Um, Trey Sanders behind him. Sonny also said that Trey is healthier than ever, and so that's good news. And then Trent Battle, Nate Palmer, who's an early enrollee. Trent Battle's been around for a few years and has been involved in the offense, mostly in the passing game when he gets opportunities. Uh, Nate Palmer was an early enrollee as a freshman, and then Jeremy Payne coming in as a true freshman as well in the fall. And so, I mean, there's not a lot of returning production at the running back spot, but I think there's enough guys. Um, I think, one, you have a good mix of different backs like you have Trey Sanders who is more of a short yardage back also just sounds like he's going to be able to add some more explosiveness to his game and some more burst given the fact that he's healthier this year um Cam Cook is going to be your do everything guy he's going to be the guy that gets the lion's share of the carries Trent Battle has been a nice change of pace player for you for a few years you can ask him to do different things and he'll step in and do his role and do it well and then, you know, potentially one of these true freshmen stepping up, I would say circle Nate Palmer's name because he's just got that extra experience of getting to go through spring practice and get more acquainted with the offense this offseason. Um, and I, I honestly feel like running back's going to be okay. I know it, it's it's totally reasonable to to think, man, why didn't they just go out and find – a productive back who could come in and at least be a good complement to what they have already in that running back room. But at the end of the day, I mean, I just, I don't think it's super wise to invest a ton of resources. And this might sound silly to some of you in that position specifically, because I really feel like it's more about the offensive scheme, the offensive line. And I also just think Cam Cook's a really talented dude. Now he's got to go do it and improve it. But, I mean, he's a four-star recruit out of high school. Um, he was highly regarded coming out of Stony Point. And I feel like the staff just believes in his ability to uh, get yardage and be a home run threat and find ways to get it done as a player for the Frogs this upcoming season. So that's your quarterback and running back room. Uh, we still got to go through the defensive line and linebacker. And we'll also talk about special teams sometime this week because, you know, that was one area – where the frogs really struggled. They were bad in, in all three phases in a lot of ways this past year. And so that has to get better as well if TCU is going to be successful uh, this upcoming season. When we come back, TCU baseball starts play in the Big 12 tournament this afternoon. We'll talk about that next on Lockdown Horn Frogs, your team every day. Speaking of uh, talent, finding people for your company, finding the best uh, – hires that you can. You don't want to mess around with it. You need to use LinkedIn.com slash Lockdown College. LinkedIn Jobs is the place to go. Over 70% of LinkedIn users don't visit other job boards. So if you're not using LinkedIn, then you're just not getting a good pool of uh, candidates for your job openings. Uh, and 86% of small businesses find a qualified candidate within 24 hours. So it makes the process fast, makes it easy. There are screening questions and different things you can put on your job posting um, to 
make the process easier and whittle down, you know, the resumes and the applications. So you're not having to sift through thousands and thousands of uh, different applications and different candidates. LinkedIn.com slash Lockdown College. You can post your job for free there at LinkedIn.com slash Lockdown College. Um, hiring people is crucial, man. You got to find the right folks uh, that fit the culture of your company that can do the job well. Have LinkedIn, LinkedIn make it easy for you. LinkedIn.com slash Lockdown College. Proud sponsor of the Lockdown Network. So I'm recording this about an hour before TCU is supposed to play in the Big 12 tournament. One thing to remember is they uh, play at Globe Life Field this week. Now, one great thing about playing at Globe Life is no rain delays, right? Because they can always just close that roof. So it's not like Oklahoma City where you would have frequent rain delays. The SEC tournament in Hoover, Alabama is notorious for games getting pushed and rescheduled and all that because of weather. But – won't have that issue. That being said, they're trying to get these games done in three and a half hour windows. And we know with baseball, even with the pitch clock, that can be tricky. Are really three hour windows because they want some time in between. But uh, TCU West Virginia is supposed to have first pitch at um, 1230 this afternoon. And big game for the Frogs. Like I, I looked at D1's latest round of 64 projections. and They'll be updating that frequently this week since – it's going to be ever changing with potential bid stealers and all that. And they had TCU still in the tournament. Uh, they were a three seed in Texas A and M as a regional. But if you go two and Q here, I think you're probably done. I'm not sure what the magic number is. It's double elimination. But I feel like you need to win two or three games this week in the Big Twelve tournament to feel good about your tournament chance, your NCAA tournament chances. Um, and to feel like you have a postseason fighting chance. So today, Cademan Parker starting against West Virginia. If the Frogs win that game, uh, then they'll play Oklahoma. And Oklahoma won the conference. They swept TCU in Fort Worth earlier this year. Now, the big decision that Kirk would have to make at that point, do you start um, Peyton Tole uh, one day early, you know, one day earlier than you typically would? On a, on a Wednesday since he pitched on Thursday, or do you wait until Thursday, either in a loser's bracket game or trying to, you know, clinch a, a championship berth to throw him out there? Um, and and the really concerning thing is, congratulations, Peyton Tully, by the way. He won Big 12 Pitcher of the Year and Newcomer of the Year yesterday. One reason why I'm not as optimistic, TCU's played well at Globe Life. They played well at the Big 12 tournament. They won it last year. Um, you know, a few years back and one of Jim's last seasons, they went to Oklahoma City and didn't really have any business, you know, playing well. And they ended up making it to – they didn't make it to the title game, but they lost to – lost to Oklahoma State in extra innings. And if they could have found a way to win that game, then they would have been in the Big 12 championship. Um, in Jim's last year, they won the title. Like, you get the picture. They played well in the Big 12 tournament. And they played really well at Globe Life. The Globe Life is pretty cavernous you know, for college baseball. So um, I think that works in TCU's advantage in some ways. You know, this offense is struggling so much, maybe it won't this year. But, I mean, once you get past Peyton, which you are you got to win in this first game today without him, you throw him in Parker instead. But once you get past Tole in the, in the rotation, I mean, it's just kind of dealer's choice. Um, and so the chances of getting multiple quality starts don't look great. Um, and this is not a team that's built to win Slugfest. So that's, you know, that's been the big issue all year long. Um, but it is an opportunity. I mean, if, you know, Oklahoma, I guess hosting is on the table for them, but there's not a ton for them to gain by running through this tournament. Maybe you catch them on an off night or maybe they throw out a young guy just to see what he's got. Um, and you can advance and at least, you know, advance to – the semifinals, which would be uh, a nice resume building situation for TCU. But yeah, big, big opportunity for the Frogs. Uh, that first game's supposed to start at 1230. If they lose, they'll play the loser of Kansas and Kansas State tomorrow morning. And then you got to fight through the loser's bracket and find a way to, you know, win three or four games in a row um, just to keep your season alive. So uh, it would be very beneficial for TCU to go out there and get a victory this afternoon, at least give themselves a chance to get a nice RPI building win against Oklahoma on neutral field if they can do that. 
um, tomorrow afternoon. But first things first, got to take care of business against West Virginia, who you lost two out of three to this past weekend. When we come back, we'll uh, wrap things up with some audience reaction. It's Locked On Horn Frogs. It's your team every day. Behind every great investor is Yahoo Finance. Yahoo Finance, they've been doing it for years. Um, wouldn't it be great if you could see all your investment and retirement accounts in one place? With Yahoo Finance, you can consolidate your views from multiple accounts into one hub and get the ac expert analysis you need to tend to your entire portfolio with confidence. If you want to grow your portfolio to deal with the rising cost of inflation, pay off your debt or your mortgage, or pretty much anything standing in the way of you and financial freedom, Yahoo Finance can get you access to the news, data, and tools you need in order to reach that financial freedom. For more than 25 years, Yahoo Finance has been the brand behind every great investor. They're the number one finance destination, producing a holistic look at the financial news cycle, including breaking news, original editorial perspectives, analyst rankings, independent research, customizable charts, and so much more. Securely link your brokerage accounts from an unified view of your wealth uh, for, for a unified view of your wealth, including 401k and other investments. A comprehensive perspective is what sets apart great investors, and it's how Yahoo Finance ensures you have the insight to look at your wealth in its entirety. Yahoo Finance, behind every great investor, is Yahoo Finance. Thank, uh, thankful for them and their sponsorship of the Lockdown Network. So I talked on yesterday's show about uh, TCU men's tennis, David Roditi and the squad. Congratulations to them. They won a national title. Also talked about the O-line room and football for this upcoming season. Jim Norris says, I don't think people around the country realize how amazing it is for a small private school like TCU with a fraction of the student body of most of their opponents to do as well as they have over the years. Bravo to the tennis team, and I have a good feeling about football this year to boot. Yeah, I mean, you know, TCU's done an amazing job. They've had a commitment to athletics for a long time. That's what got them in the Big 12. That's what's given them staying power in the Big 12. And it's what gives me hope in the new landscape, even though the cards are stacked against Big 12 teams like TCU when it comes to comparisons to the SEC and the Big 10. I mean, Jeremiah Donati and before him, Crystal Conte, and the athletic directors that came before those guys, the coaches here, like they have showed a commitment and a drive that they want to be great at this and that they are – willing and able to invest at a high level in these different sports so that TCU can stay competitive in every level of it. Um, and so that's what gives me hope for the future. Uh, Jacob Langford said, quite amazing. They avenged all their losses. They had lost 4 nothing to UT the last time they played. Intense match, and Rodidi and the boys got it done. Yeah, they had some battles with UT this year. I mean, they won that um, match at home. I believe it was 4-3, and then they got skunked by UT in Austin, but came back and – just found a way to get it done. Uh, really awesome by that team to, to bring it home and make it happen. Big Easy says, great. And Natty is a Natty. Congratulations to the team and go Frogs. Uh, yes, sir. I mean, national titles, whatever the sport is, it's a huge accomplishment. And, um, I mean, it got a lot of attention, you know, on social media and, and all those different places because it was a great match. I mean, it was electrifying watching those two teams compete at a high level. And then Brian Caper says, TCU, long live the little sisters of the poor. Perfect storm to win the Natty against your Big Tennis rival and kick them out the door. Congrats, Frogs, on an unbelievable run. Yeah, it was really sweet beating Texas and sending them to the SEC with a, uh, a national championship and with TCU a national championship in men's tennis. And, you know, I, I get what you're saying. I get the joke. I really don't think TCU is the little sisters of the poor anymore, though. I feel like they're right there with everybody else. They have, as I said earlier, the investment and the commitment to athletics – has been incredible over the past few decades and the frogs are competing in, in everything now. So hopefully baseball can put together a good week at the Big 12 tournament and we can have some more postseason games to talk about soon. This is the Lockdown Horn Frogs. It's your team. We do it here every day.